This apparently rural scene is situated only eight miles from the centre of London at Hackbridge near to Mitcham in Surrey. A fast flowing river in previous centuries, the Wandle now makes a more leisurely way to its mouth at Wandsworth, where it joins the River Thames. A new housing estate has been built nearby. with some unusual names. These names are all that remains today to remind us of the existence once of a large factory on this 15-acre site. except for these bicycle sheds. This factory's history had several sources. One was Captain Stanley Robert Mullard, born in 1883. He left school at 14 for an electrical engineering apprenticeship in his father's small electric lamp factory. After working in Europe, he joined Ediswan in 1914. By 1916, he was commissioned in the Navy testing radio valves, and when demobilized three years later, he became a director of the Z Lamp and Electrical Company. He maintained his wartime connections with the Naval Signal School at Portsmouth, perfecting the development of high-power silica transmitting valves. The Admiralty persuaded Mullard to start making these valves and so in 1920 the Mullard Radio Valve Company was born, with these men managing the early days. Demand also expanded for Mullard's Aura Receiving Valves, Aura standing for Oscillate, Rectify and Amplify, valves aimed at the amateur radio market. Mullard was quick to use the cinema to advertise its products. In 1921, the company moved to Hammersmith, and in 1924, moved again to Ballam, where by now the company was making two and a half million valves a year.
Mullard invented the catchphrase, Mullard, the master valve. But he became embroiled in patent arguments with the Marconi Company. Mullard won, but to protect the business from competitors and provide finance for development and expansion, Mullard sold a 50% interest in the company to Philips in Holland. The Phillips Company is another beginning to our story. Frederick Phillips was a well-off merchant banker in Holland and father of two brothers. One son, Gerard, born in 1858, wanted to be an engineer and when 27 went to Delft University. He then decided electric light bulbs were the future, so his father sent him to England to City and Guilds in London to study electric lighting after which he moved to Glasgow to work in Lord Kelvin's laboratory. Anton, who was 14 years younger, wanted to be a stockbroker and also came to the UK to the City of London. The brothers began the Phillips Company in Eindhoven in 1891, initially making light bulbs but later expanding to include radios and all their various components. From this first building in Eindhoven, Philips expanded to become a multinational, employing more than 400,000 people worldwide. Returning to the Hackbridge site, we now understand why the names Mullard, Philips and Eindhoven are remembered here in these road names. In the 19th century, the then fast-flowing river Wandles supplied water power for the factory machinery and fresh water for textile and leather dressing industries. The leather works at Hackbridge was completely destroyed by fire in the 1920s, leaving a suitable brownfield site for an expanding company. As Mullard was now too big for its Ballam site, Hackbridge was cleared of most of the tannery remains and the first Phillips building, called A, was completed in 1929. It was a copy of Philips buildings in Holland and was used for the manufacture of radios and the housing of the service department. The land was so waterlogged that A building was floating and water was constantly pumped out from its foundations. The first radio was produced in 1930. It was regarded as portable and yet weighed 47 pounds. Within two years, the demand for more space meant that a building was required for valve making and another was needed for radio set production. Anton Phillips was travelling through Louvain in Belgium when he saw a factory building being dismantled. He bought it and sent it to Hackbridge to become B building. In 1934, the Culver's Road end of B building was erected, the foundation stone being laid by a seven-year-old Dutch boy, Humph Verkirk. B building was used to rehouse the radio set making activity. In 1936, a sister building to A was built and christened C. This building was primarily used for components and particularly for housing the then secret Philips processing for valve cathodes, a process enabling excellent valves to be made throughout the war. Some former Mitchum employees were interviewed for this video. Jerry Thurmer was asked for his impressions on arriving from Holland. Right, we went into Mitchum, and of course Mitchum was like a home from home, because the two buildings were typical Eindhoven buildings. Later on, we, I found that one was a metric building, and the other one was a footage building. And you can see the difference when you went from one building to the other. As you go on the fourth floor, it gets a bit steep to go up from one floor to the other. Okay. Do 
The old tannery chimney was finally demolished by the local plant department in 1935 when a round stone that had been sitting on the top fell, chasing Mr. Aninga, the observing plant director, and finally coming to rest on the top of J.M. Lawrence's car. In 1938, a canteen building was completed, a facility to be of great benefit during the Second World War. The River Wandle provided attractive views from the canteen. Much of the production was making radios. The initial range was the 630 and the 830. When the last 830 was completed in 1933, more than 180,000 had been made. This is a three-valve, two-band TRF straight battery set, the MB3, made from 1935 to 38. The range of radios made then included battery and mains-powered versions, long, medium and short-wave models, car radios for 6 and 12-volt vehicles, radiograms, and models with magic eye tuning. This wartime four-valve set was made from 1944 onwards. The owner was asked on the back of the set to switch off when not in use in the interest of economy. There were also the first 9-inch screen and projection TVs and radiograms. More than a thousand radio sets were made each day. They were expensive. The V7A cost seven guineas, although it was designed as a cheap model, doing away with the usual metal chassis and instead nestling the components in cavities in a Bakelite case which was then wired together. The working week was 47 and a half hours with one week's holiday. Redundancy notice could be one hour plus one minute. The shortest anyone remembered was three hours when the whole belt were given their marching orders. A belt consisted of 40 women, each adding her specific part to the assembly so that after about an hour the completed radio would hopefully burst into song when switched on at the end of the line. There were fault finders, charge hands and random test operators. The latter were paid halfpenny an hour more, so earning two pounds fifteen shillings a week by 1934. In contrast, a skilled toolmaker earned six pounds a week. This letter from the Mullard Radio Valve Company offers a junior staff appointment at one pound ten shillings a week. The main market for radios was at Christmas, and production was therefore seasonal from July onwards. Phillips tried to keep as many employees working as possible by having an intermediate season around Easter. This photo, taken 60 years later in 1996, shows three engineers of the 30s, Messrs Priestland, Thurma and Van Horn. By the early 1930s, Mullard was selling 29 different types of valve in its valve guide booklet. They included two-volt batteries and mains-operated rectifiers, triodes and pentodes. They weren't cheap, being almost one pound each. It's interesting to see that Mullard in those early days already offered application support in the technical appendix and throughout the valve guide. The mid-30s saw employees involved in various social activities and welcoming visitors such as this party of Australian cricketers. Phillips had its own cricketers. and keep fit classes for ladies in 1938. As wartime approached, as well as being entertained by visiting bands, there was serious work making, tuner units for bombers radios, teleprinter coils and wireless sets for use in tanks. Also, parts for bombs, detonators and machine gun belts. If you 
introduce yourself. Tell us when you came over to, to Britain, where you came from, and what you came to do. Right. Well, I joined the company in 1937 as a young man. Uh, only one of a few, because there was a lot of uh, unemployment in Holland. So I was very lucky to be selected by the company, uh, via several processes, to work uh, in Eindhoven. And I started in the X-ray department as a draftsman for a few months. And then I was uh, brought up to the third floor, where the actual X-ray tube department was. And I became a supervisor. Uh, that's how it all started, you see. And then when the war broke out, that's one of these companies of the radius. When the war broke out, uh, it was found that uh, there was no X-ray tube technology or manufacture in England. In fact, most of the stuff came from Germany, because that wouldn't do at all. So the Eintel management was asked to set up an X-ray tube making department in, in Mitchell. And I was called up to the director's office. And he said to me, you're really much too young, but that's right in itself day by day. And uh, I want to send you to England, you see. This was quite, quite something, of course. It was an adventure in those days to go to a country at war. You can just imagine. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a few months to get everything together, to get enough material for 500 troops and all the equipment which was goes with it. And that's when I hit on the idea, because I knew there was an, uh, a pump bench, which is a, a major piece of equipment. This was that from here to the second floor, quite a big piece of equipment. I knew there was one standing idle in Hamburg, but, but I had spent some time. So I was able to get it out of Hamburg into Eindhoven, and then ship it across to England eventually. Was your wife able to leave Holland and join you in England? I came over in March, and what happened then is that uh, we were married, as I said, and uh, then the Germans invaded Norway. In fact, you may have heard of it, but we were involved at the time, you know, there was a major, major thing happening. Uh, they invaded Norway. So I was quite anxious. That was an April. I thought, come, if it happens again, she might never come across. So I went to headquarters in Central House to see Mr. Gray, a typical Scottish dark gentleman, you see. And he was the head of the whole setup. It was this day, he actually set up. I said, look, well, he said, I'm getting a bit worried because my wife is still over in Holland and who knows what might happen next. Right, he said, we sent a telegram to Mr. Van Ditshuizen in Eindhoven. And he was the, uh, the man who organized everything, you see, the Gambell. So, right, he got a secretary in and started dictating, please send wife as soon as possible, signed to her. So he said, uh, please, sir, would you mind maybe uh, send my wife as soon as possible? Because I didn't fancy Mr. when this started coming out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's on record, that's a fact. That happens. They said bye bye as soon as possible. And, and your wife said, arrived? Yes, ten days before the invasion. She arrived in a blackout plane, black, blackout plane, in Shoreham Airport, a tiny little airport on the coast. And we went to fetch her there. And then we took her into Brighton and, and gave her some English tea. And it's the first time ever in her life she had baked beans and toasties. So, all <laughs> new experiences. Sorry about all this nonsense, but. You know, it's interesting. War brought air raids to Mitcham. Doug is asked how this affected production. In, in the night shift, the alarms would go outside and then people would go to the uh, shelter. We were losing too much time, so a system was established where we would have on the roof someone watching, so the sirens may have gone outside, but we took no notice of that. They kept on working until someone on the roof would sound the local alert because we'd seen the bombers coming around. And that was in 1940. And my very first night that I should have been on, place was taken by another fellow. The plane spotters made charcoal drawings of Allied and enemy aircraft on the walls of their base in a lift motor room, which remained until the plant's final demolition. The factory's importance encouraged visits by Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands and by Watson Watt, the wartime inventor, 
and Tutor E, the Home Secretary. By chance, the worst bomb damage occurred immediately after his Mitcham visit, when a flying bomb demolished the corner of A building. The plant director's office was damaged, but fortunately the occupant, Mr. Cloppert, was sheltering under this large and substantial roll-top desk. But I gather Mr. Cloppert was in his office in A building when the flying bomb fell, climbed underneath the desk, uh, and the damage on the top uh, came about from chunks of concrete which fell on the desk. The desk obviously preserved him from injury or made... 17,000 panes of glass were blown out at this time. Not everyone dived under the plant director's desk. Purpose-built air raid shelters were available. It was stated that by the end of the war, every British naval, army and air force piece of equipment had at least one mullard valve in it, often the famous EF-50. British radar depended on mullard's all-glass receiving valve technology in producing the glass, the wire and the all-important cathodes. The war encouraged the development of new receiving valves at Mitcham, as Mallard was now cut off from any new Dutch input. There was a tremendous atmosphere during the war, with operators singing as they worked, their hair in curlers, covered by a scarf, preparing to meet their soldiers afterwards. Many of the workers were in the local Home Guard unit. This is their 1944 farewell dinner, with the rather novel French menu, which includes Potage Square, camouflage vert and wallop. Peace did not bring an easy time to Mitcham. Returning workers from the forces had to be integrated with those who'd continued working at Mitcham throughout the war. Markets and suppliers changed, government contracts were stopped and the power cuts in 1947 had serious effects on production. Nevertheless, 1946 saw the introduction of cathode ray tube production and a year later, quantity manufacture of television sets. Social activities were plentiful in spite of a 48-hour working week. The annual sports day in 1948 clearly encouraged the female staff to compete. Football medals could be won in the Interdepartmental Soccer Cup competition and no doubt equally competitive were the Mullard v Mitcham Works soccer matches. Less competitive was a day trip to Hastings in 1950. Mitcham was often visited by famous people, including Margaret Lockwood, Britain's number one film star, in 1948. Not all glamour was imported. The Mitcham Amateur Dramatic Society, MADS, put on many shows. such as The Chocolate Soldier in 1945, an Aladdin pantomime in 1954, and Robinson Crusoe in 1952. Mitcham opened feeder valve-making factories at Gillingham in 1946, at Hove in 1947, and at Whiteleaf in 1951. In spite of the fact that the Mullard Blackburn factory was now making more receiving valves than Mitcham. A 
As well as valves and picture tubes, Mitchum was also making X-ray tubes and the first Geiger counters born out of the new need to detect radioactivity. Mitchum began to develop its own products and enlarged its applications laboratory under A.J. Hines an activity which offered sales support to Mullard for over 50 years and whose work was often to influence the worldwide electronics industry. In the early 50s, the laboratory became famous for its Mullard 510 Hi-Fi audio amplifier using five valves and giving 10 watts of power output. These designs were constructed by DIY enthusiasts all over the country as Mullard offered the aluminium chassis layout designs and assembly guidance as well as the circuit. This and other later designs greatly enhanced the reputation of Mullard and its valves. Joan, how did you get a job at Mitcham? You used to have to go to the labour exchange in those days to get permission to get a job just after the war and uh, they said that they'd got a vacancy for a short-hand typist at Mullard's, or at least at Mitchum Works. And the building was always such that I, it, I used to associate it as looking like a prison. Um, and I used to think, oh, I don't think I ever want to work in there. But I, um, off I went for the interview, which had actually been taken. So I said, fair enough, okay, I'll go. And personnel said, no, 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 don't. We have a gentleman that wants a secretary, but you might be too young. Because I was about 21 then, I suppose. So I held on, and I had the interview, and I got the job. And that's when I started in 1949. I suppose for me, perhaps it wasn't quite so strict environment as on the factory side. The factory side was very strict if, you know, you stopped on the production line, you were in trouble, and you never got the sack unless you'd done something really drastic, but it was a very strict routine. I see. Right. Now tell me a bit about when you came back, how the things changed? Well, because uh, the place was the same, but uh, a part that you will learn about, uh, which was Mitchum Works, had gone, and now we've taken over that uh, building too, for with the engineering uh, shop and others. And uh, so the whole place was then Mullard, uh, and Mitchum, not uh, yes, and not Mullard one side of the uh, of the main road, and the other side Mitchum Works. Mm, that's right. So uh, it was all Mullard then, when I came back. And uh, it had changed in as much as uh, uh, several uh, uh, departments of valve making had uh, shrunk enormously. And now we'd already got in 1957, we were doing semiconductors there, uh, X-ray was very, uh, very big, and, uh, and, and we even started catheter in numbers. So the, the plant had changed enormously. For the better or for the worse, or do you think it was just natural for a big company like that? I didn't even question it. it, it it was only natural expansion, I suppose, and uh, Mitchum was the sort of heart of where new things came and progress from there. And of course, then we eventually had the uh, factories in Southampton and uh, others in Lancashire again. Now, what about the relationship between the factory here and your Dutch owners? What, what was that like? Well, Philip's over uh, in, uh, in Holland. Uh, the greatest issues were really between the production people, the accountants, and the selling people. They were where the, the issues really <laughs> came. We wanted uh, more and more uh, of lesser uh, groups, whilst the uh, selling organisation would want something new and quick. And so. Uh, but that's a, a natural uh, industrial problem. I don't think anything really exceptional. In 1957, Philip's set-making moved to Croydon, and Mitchum was all Mullard. 
a growing activity was training. As early as 1947, 40 five-year craft apprentices were being taught in their own training workshops and on the job in the factory. There was also a full-time trainer for the blind and partially sighted, assisting approximately 24 operators at any one time. The relocation of set making provided more space for new activities, such as ferrite memory cores in 1956 and matrix stacks a year later. The ferrite memory cores were so small that the 20 and 30 mil cores could be placed on the wings of a common housefly. Each core was threaded by hand with four fine wires and interconnected to form a matrix plane. One application was in the British Aerospace Rapier ground-to-air missile used so successfully in the Falklands conflict. By 1961, the number of people working at Mitcham peaked at just over 4,000. Such a variety of activities required a large machine and tool-making department to support them. Nearly 300 crafts and draftsmen worked in the engineering department, designing and building many unique production machines for the factory. Most people travelled by bus, walked or cycled to work from the local housing estates and often went home for lunch. In the 1960s, Mitcham changed. Numbers of production operators fell whilst more people worked on development and pre-production of new products. This is a demonstration board of a radio made in the application laboratory using the LP1150 radio module and the LP1153-350 milliwatt audio module. These modules were developed at Mitcham and then made in the Hamilton and Southport factories. A newly introduced technology was thin film for making circuits on 2 by 3 cm glass substrates with gold conductors. Resistors of nickel and chromium and capacitors of aluminium and silicon monoxide. These assemblies were used in high quality applications such as the Eldo rocket, the first European rocket. More than 100 glass circuits were interconnected and then encapsulated for use in the rocket. To provide space for the introduction of new products, established ones, such as picture tubes and semiconductors, were transferred to newly built Mullard factories at Southampton, Simmonstone and Stockport. This is a map of the Mitcham plant in 1964, showing the distribution of the different product departments around the site. S building contained the applications research laboratory and apprentice training. B building made radio valves and housed engineering and auxiliary support activities. A building's floors were for semiconductors, magnets, X-ray tubes and gas-filled valves such as Decatrons, one of the first electronic counting devices. C building housed transmitting and microwave productions including magnetrons and large transmitting valves. Finally, ferrites were in D-building. Many different products and disciplines led to a quite complex organisation. Doug Priestland was plant director with a number of product divisions. Semiconductors led by Doug Keithley, special tubes including X-ray, Geiger Muller and Gasfield Van Horn. Receiving valves by FM Walker. Support departments included personnel under John Ross and production planning led by Barton. Two other important activities based at Mitcham were applications under A.J. Hines and the Materials Research Laboratory under Dr. Van Mol. The earlier factory layout was cluttered and poorly lit. were made to the factory and buildings. The composition Italian floors were covered with modern vinyl tiles and the valve making activity reorganized to provide more space and light as well as being safer and offering greater efficiency.
Additionally, the front of B building was taken down and rebuilt to offer a more imposing entrance for the frequent visitors to the plant. The applications lab changed its name several times and grew in size. The transmitting sections were first housed in the main factory and were unpopular when testing their powerful 10 megahertz equipment which interfered with everyone's televisions. Fortunately, television was not then broadcast during the working day. The remainder of the lab was on the island, a part of the plant approached by pedestrian bridges over the River Wandle. The lab moved to S building. Then B building and finally A. by which time it had more than a hundred engineers, technicians and admin support staff. Its role was to foresee what products would be needed in the future by Mallard's customers, specify these in good time for the development departments to design and produce first samples, then when the product arrived to help the customer use it successfully. To do this the department needed experts in all branches of electronic applications, computers, radio and television, telecommunications, industrial control, auto electronics, washing machines and so on. Whilst this in the earlier days meant hardware designers using soldering irons and metal chassis, later it meant the computer aided design of printed circuit boards and finally software engineers and system designers of silicon integrated chips. The Central Materials Laboratory comprised more than 40 chemists, physicists and technicians who provided support for all the factory production and development activities around the UK, not just Mitcham. It provided chemical analysis using such equipment as electron microscopes, making small quantities of plastic mouldings and printed circuit boards, offering safety advice on chemical handling and fire prevention, exploits remembered at a reunion. People at Mitcham felt they belonged to a friendly, caring and successful activity, rather like a large family, and it was very common for employees to complete 40 years of service. Phillips always celebrated an employee's successful completion of 25 and 40 years, with drinks, a buffet and speeches to which the employee's family were invited. A year's double holiday entitlement and two months extra salary plus a gold watch or equivalent also marked the day. The event celebrations began with the firm's car collecting the employees and his family early in the afternoon and the family then touring the site, having tea with the plant director or divisional head and finally attending the party in the canteen. Colleagues also gave money towards a present and in many departments also created some unusual items to give their colleagues.
The application lab had their own cartoonist, Miriam Mason, so that everyone in the department received a drawing on their 25th or other special event in their lives. This family team spirit encouraged competition between departments and between departments and their commercial counterparts. Bets were placed as to whether targets would be met and repaid in some novel ways. A one pound note encapsulated inside an image intensifier tube was not easy to cash at the bank. By the 1970s, Mitchum was finding that successful product lines moved elsewhere and the less successful remained at low levels of production or fell by the wayside. X-ray tube production closed after some 30 years in 1969. Thin film circuits in 1970. Ferrites and special magnets moved out in 71. And matrix memory stacks were finally replaced by new technology semiconductor memories in 1975. The Mullard Company celebrated its Golden Jubilee in 1970 and gave each employee a specially grown rose, the Mullard Jubilee Rose, many of which are still flourishing in former employees' gardens. Attend the fair held on the car park and meet the Mitchum Rose Princess. By 1976, the manufacturing and development work was dominated by the electron optics and the electronic assemblies divisions, although a new activity was evolving based in the engineering department, and this was the Mitchum Engineering Centre. This activity designed, built and tested manufacturing equipment for other Philips manufacturing plants in Great Britain and around the rest of Europe, as well as for production activities in Mitchum. The electron optics division drew its own glass fibers which were then combined into channel plates and finally assembled with other components in a special clean room to produce the image intensifiers which were sold mainly for British and foreign military use. Their expertise was such that many countries sent parties to visit the plant. One famous one was a Chinese party in 1982. The Electronic Assemblies Division grew out of the amalgamation of the industrial and consumer assemblies activities. Printed circuit board and thick film circuit assemblies were made in their thousands for many different applications, but perhaps the most famous was the collaboration with the Applications Laboratory and Southampton Integrated Circuit Factory in developing and making the first Teletext circuits. Completion of the first half million Teletext modules was celebrated with a cake baked at the factory as a large replica of a Teletext decoder. Some types of modules were ultimately mass produced in Blackburn, but all were developed at Mitcham. Their final market applications were very different and ranged from 25 kilowatt triplers for televisions, washing machine speed control and programmer modules, car alternator regulators and anti-lock braking for cars and lorries.
There was also one of the first personal computers using more than a hundred silicon chips on one board. All electronic electricity measuring and energy management meters, view data and so on. Mitchum also produced Norbits for a period. These looked like oversized dual in-line integrated circuits, but were a range of different digital circuit functions executed using conventional components on a printed board, which was then covered by a plastic molding. By 1976, the number of people working at Mitcham had fallen to 2,000, of which 1,300 were in manufacturing. Special quality receiving valves were still being made, however, even as late as 1985. There were various manufacturing stages of a micro-miniature valve, assembly and welding, cleaning and glass envelope ceiling And finally, Gettering. When production of a product ceased, Mitchum used it as an excuse for a party. The so-called Norbit Wake was one such celebration in 1982. As well as a wreath laid at the flagpole, Food and drink were consumed by the Mullard managing director and factory workers alike. Other opportunities for fun and games were fates organized by the social club and charity committees. People ran in the London Marathon. Shows were given by the Dramatic Society, Mads, and concerts performed at Christmas and at fates by the Mitcham Band. Most departments held a Christmas party, often in the social club on the island, although Father Christmas was known to visit the factory tea break areas. The move of the applications laboratory from the island some years earlier had enabled the sports and social club to have an area for table tennis, snooker and a very welcome bar. A feature only open in the evenings after work. Tell me a bit about your canteen at 4950. And we used to have the trolley come round from the canteen in the day, daytime. And I can remember one instance, we had quite a rough lady that was out trolley lady. She was a good-hearted soul, but we had um, a gentleman in estimating that could have been very awkward at times. 
And I mean, we used to have proper china cups in those days, you see, and she used to deliver, you'd get your tea, and then she'd come round about a quarter of an hour later, half an hour later, to collect the cups. And on this particular instant, this particular gentleman was busy. I mean, he was working hard, we all had to work hard, <laughs> and his cup was on the desk. So she shouts out, cups, you see, and everybody gets up and gives her the cup, but not this particular person. So she shouts again, cups. So he said, if you want the cup, I'm too busy, you've got to come and collect it. So she stormed over, picked the cup up, she says, no more tea for you ever again. And she never served him with any more. Fun, wasn't it? Tell me about some of the jigs that you were Oh, yes. I mean, I mean, on the one hand, there was this sort of very uh, strict academic kind of thing, but particularly in the technical area, I think it was the technical area, the engineers, the development engineers, the application engineers, used to get up to various things at various times. Um, one which was highly dangerous was that people would put a, um, a cap, you know, these things you can make bangs with, um, underneath the soldering iron bits, and then they would be left. Uh, disconnected, and when somebody plugged it in, it warmed up, there would suddenly be a bang as, the, as it exploded, and the, the bit, which was quite a solid bit of copper, would go flying across the room. Uh, there was a total ban on that on my occasion, because somebody, you know, almost did get a, a nasty accident with it. Um, another time I can remember when, we used to have factory shutdowns in those days, when the whole factory closed for two weeks in the summer, there was only a limited number of people who were uh, allowed in. We, we application engineers were in because we had to give a service to customers even who weren't on shutdown themselves. And I can remember on one occasion somebody was demonstrating their keep fit activities of doing press ups on a, on a, uh, over a doorway. And we were on, the, on what was called the island, which was a, 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 there was a little bridge that footbridge you could get to it. He was on doing it on the main doorway. And we were all looking at it and persuading the man to do three more and four more and five more. And suddenly he was so straining at doing this, I don't think he noticed that our faces had changed out of all recognition, because the plant director, unfortunately, wasn't on shutdown either, and he'd come up behind him at the time. A sack of all the pets? Uh, actually, he was remarkably good about it. I can't remember whether it was Mr. Priestland or somebody, or somebody else. But... Mitcham personnel was still being inventive. The Assembly's activity was the first in 1980 in the UK to invest significantly in surface mount technology. You're watching components being placed on programmer modules at a rate of 11,000 an hour using the twin insertion heads. Whilst many assemblies still utilize all conventional components, surface mounted technology is advancing rapidly and the high volume automated machinery gives unit cost reductions at a high accuracy of component positioning. This computerized placement machinery is applying glue to the teletext printed circuit board and it then places the components on the board in the same sequence. The division has made over half a million teletext modules in the last four and a half years, at a rate of 1,000 a day during the peak period. This is Philips MCM2 surface-mounted device placement system. The whole process is software controlled, which enables a rapid changeover to the manufacture of different modules. The combined capacity of these two machines is around 64 million placements a year. CML were working on iron motors for space rockets, and new, smaller image intensifiers were being developed. But it became increasingly obvious by the middle to late 80s that the writing was on the wall as far as Mitchum's future was concerned. The application laboratory's future was so linked to integrated circuit development that it moved to Southampton. Sub-assemblies and modules were no longer seen by Philips components as their type of business. Philips were also vacating much of the industrial and military markets, and so the Geiger-Muller business was sold to a third party. Finally, the intensifier work could be transferred to a similar activity in France. There was a delay when a significant number of Philips UK central and administrative activities were transferred to Mitcham as a result of closing other plants and with the stated intention of further vacating the leased offices in West Croydon. This final step didn't occur, and so all the lodgers returned again to Croydon. The plant finally closed at Christmas 1993, and the flag was lowered for the last time.
the demolition gangs moved in soon after to prepare the site for today's housing. was always associated with being a big family and I think in a way that was why when it closed and the actual factory went it was so sad. <laughs> 